so you know welcome to those of you that have logged on now um my name is uh, rob Fien. i am a member of the london society committee and um this is the first time i've chaired a virtual event for the society um but i'm very pleased to do so um as you might be aware we've got you know a number we've we've tried to roll with the punches of uh, the current circumstances and we've got we've had quite a lot of online events um, we've got more coming up uh, so on the 25th of July we have a social housing v tour uh, so a virtual tour with the London Ambler which is worth checking out I think that's our next event uh, although we do also have the um, AGM next week as well uh, and then on the 30th of July uh, we've got a talk called The Fabric of London, which is being uh, presented by uh, Elliot Wood. So that will really look at the materials uh, that make up the buildings that surround us. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that one as well. Um, I think I'll start introducing uh, Tessa and the Hackney Mosaic Project. If you've read the blurb on the website, you'll already know this, but just in case, uh, the Mosaic project was set up in 2011 uh, as a six month project uh, to create mosaics for the London Olympics. But they, Tessa, Tessa hasn't stopped there. Um, and so her community art project um, has continued uh, for nine years um, uh, and many, many many more uh, mosaics um tessa's trained as an architect um before getting involved with uh, uh emma biggs at the mosaic workshop and um now she's working with a group of volunteers in the hackney mosaic project uh, including vulnerable adults in recovery from mental health and addiction problems but i don't need to go into too much detail about that because I think that Tess is going to uh, enlighten us more. And then uh, we do have a function for asking questions. Uh, so please use the Q and A if anything pops into your head and I will dig through it and relay that to Tessa um, after she's finished her presentation. So I think uh, without further ado, Tessa, would you like to perhaps share your screen and uh, get us started on a tour of the Hackney Mosaic project. Does that look right? Looks good to me. Uh, so everybody can see that, can they? I can see it and so I'm sure everyone else can. Good. Uh, but now I just have to work out how to change the picture. So I should have done this. It's not going to move for me. Play. Just press the play button. Yeah, you can click through it. There we go. Okay, that's a that's a better picture. Um, okay, am I on then? You are, yeah. please start. Okay, well, um, thank you very much for inviting me to talk today. Um, I'm going to talk about my, the project that I set up uh, nine years ago. Um, before I set up this mosaic project, I was working as a professional mosaicist, and I've been doing that for about 20 years, so I've done a lot of mosaic in my life by now. Um, and I was always aware of community mosaic. Um, and public art mosaics. Um, and to be honest, they always made me feel a little bit sad. Um, I quite understood the, you know, the reasoning behind it. I'm, I'm a maker myself and I, I love making things and I think it's very important for people to have the opportunity to make things. Um, and I think it, I, I've always thought it had great potential. You know, I know, I know it's important for my mental health. Um, and so it always seemed to me that it might be good for, for other people. Um, but so much of what was produced was a bit kind of sad and 
used to make me a bit cross because I felt it wasn't doing the whole thing of mosaic very much justice. Increasingly public art projects had to have a kind of community element. Um, and while they were obviously fun to make, um, they very often weren't fun to look at. Uh, and so I thought, well, there must be a way of doing this a bit better. Um, and uh, I got help from a very unlikely source, um, and that was the ancient Romans. Um, I don't think they had any interest in community art, um, but um, they did um, they did work. Their, their beautiful large mosaics were made by teams of many people. They're so large, they must have had lots of people working on them. Um, and you can't see the joins. You can't really see where one person did something or one person didn't. But at the same time, they're not incredibly rigid. They, they have a sort of looseness and freedom about them that um, sort of Victorian mosaics don't have. Um, and there was something sort of slightly magical about the way Roman mosaics clearly have a, a very um, comprehensive set of rules, but they aren't rigid. This is very clever, uh, but I thought, yes, this might be a way of improving community art. The, I, I had a book of um, Tunisian mosaics and I, op I can remember it was like a flash of lightning on a dark night. I opened this book and I thought, yes, I could, I could try and do this. Um, and uh, luckily, this was just before the Olympics, and so I could use the Olympics as a peg. I don't think anybody else really um, saw the connection between Roman mosaics and the Olympics, but in my mind, they come from the classical world, and so it was absolutely obvious that to celebrate London in the year of the Olympics, you had to have mosaics. Um, and I did manage to persuade Hackney that the, um, this was true. Uh, and so these are the first ones that we made. So they are very Roman in feel. They're based on the seasons, which is a very um, traditional Roman subject. Um, but I was aware that, you know, there was something slightly anachronistic about doing Roman things in Hackney. So I put in little modern uh, motifs, like in the jogger is, um, has got is listening to uh, an iPod and there's a skateboard and there are people on mobile phones. So that's the um, spring and summer and that's the winter where there are more mobile phones and a leaf blower and some binoculars and things. So it, it had a kind of modern twist and the idea was that it was what people did in the parks and in the year of the Olympics it was celebrating not just what the brilliant athletes do but also what um, the ordinary people do the kind of activities they get up to in the open air, taking their own kinds of physical exercise. Um, so yeah, so that was um, that went quite well, uh, and people obviously did enjoy doing it. And so we did some more uh, in the same area. Uh, it was a funny little corner of a park. It was, I think, it was because nobody else knew what to do with it, um, and the park is in Shepherdess Walk. So this was the next one that we did. Um, I started having to kind of grope with, with the problem of what is a suitable subject for public art. I think it is quite a difficult issue because, you know, it's in the public realm. You want to try and please people, as many people as you can, and do things that um, people will enjoy and that will be entertaining. I mean, I'm a great believer that the city should have bits of entertainment in it. And, Things like colour um, brightens up these, these dark corners. A little bit of local history, um, the local community find interesting. So these were the shepherdesses of, of the shepherdess walk. Again, it's, it's in, very much informed by traditional mosaics. So the pattern um, comes from um, uh, sort of Byzantine, well, late antique mosaics. Um, I discovered that having borders around things was very, very useful in a community project because they were kind of um, for good for the beginners and then people would learn things and they would um, uh, move on up to blades of grass, maybe, maybe a bird. And then finally, well, sheep 
maybe before a figure, but yeah, so there was a sort of learning curve that, that, that participants could do. Uh, and then we did some more in this same area. Um, again, having to find other new um, subject matters uh, and nature, nature again, very uncontroversial, but you know, gives pleasure to almost everybody really. It's very um, widely popular. So um, I thought that would be good. So these are, um, I suppose people would describe them as weeds, but I've always thought of them as wildflowers. And they, I chose the species as being ones that you find in the city. So there's a little bit of sort of um, education there. I'm very interested in the names of plants. And uh, so people who are interested might actually be able to identify things from this. And there are little insects in there as well. Um, Marbus, I think, might be a little film that I took just the other day to show it in in situ. So it's it's in a sort of complete corner of the park, and the Hackney Parks surprisingly have actually seemed to care for it and have put in some new part planting and cut down some of the trees. But um, yeah, so that's um, that's kind of how it how it works in in situ and you can see the pavement in the corner and some extra patterns as well so yeah we did we did a lot in shepherdess walk uh and there we all are at the at the end of of that installation um and it looks like you know the remains of a roman villa it's pretty eccentric really but um people did enjoy making it and uh I hope people enjoy looking at it. Um, this is one of the, the we, I got people to make this piece as well. To This is a more sort of conceptual way of looking at it, but it captures some of the ideas of rules and control that, you know, if you have quite a lot of rules in this, you know, they were in, everybody had a different square to make and they were only allowed to use one color. Um, but even within that, they managed to do all kinds of different things and that's, that's what makes it interesting it's the balance between the rules and the, the, the freedom and the control i suppose um this was the next um project we got to do um by this time we had a, a great um uh, champion in, in hackney carol evans who um got us this fantastic um commission uh in on hackney downs this is a shelter in the children's playground um, and we were able to decorate this, um, this time with um, not exactly Hackney wildlife, well one hopes not, um, but uh, more like charismatic megafauna, the big, the big animals. And the excuse for this was that it's in a children's playground and obviously um, children, um, children like animals. Uh, and I must say, it, it, it's very sweet, it's quite successful. I sometimes go in there and there are small children stroking the animals. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I think, I think they quite enjoy it. Um, and it's also, it's got the names again. Uh, and I hope I've been able to introduce a, an entire generation of children to the Okapi, which is um, important. Um, and it also has the names of the people who um, helped to make the mosaic. This is a very popular, this turned out to be, it wasn't in my original plan, but wherever possible now, I do um, try and include this. It's very popular, people like to have their names up. They have absolute freedom about how they, how they write their names. And it's something that they can then um, show off to uh, friends and family. Um, and I should say that one or two, well, three actually of, of the names here are actually memorials now um, to people who, who are no longer with us. So that's quite moving for the rest of the group and, and for their families. It's nice that they've had a, um, there is something there to memorialize them. Um, and that was the, um, the opening event for the wild animals. You can see it's a sort of motley crew with Russell Brand, who fits in surprisingly well. He was actually just there to open it. But um, uh, yeah, that was the closest we ever got to fame. Um, and then we just sort of carried on really, um, still using the Roman theme as a way of uh, uniting people's different um, 
abilities and styles. Uh, this was for another park, but here liberated a bit from the Roman idea. I could introduce other colours and make it a bit more colourful. Um, again, this is a children's playground, so it's um, a, the theme of counting. And then we did the alphabet as well. Um, and you can see that the team are getting pretty good by now. They're... So the, the problem of um, leveling up the, the, the skills um, has diminished over time as, as, as they've got better and better at it. Um, and there, there they are again. Um, you can see from this, this is actually how, how we do the making. Um, it's something called the indirect method. Some of you may know this about mosaic, but it's jolly clever method. And you make everything back to front on paper, which means that everybody can work in, in our studio in Hackney Downs at tables in comfort. Quite a lot of people um, who I work with have got physical problems. Um, so this is really important. Um, so they sit at tables. Uh, I cut up the designs into sections and they get a section each. Um, and, uh, and then when it comes to fix it to the wall, we put adhesive on the wall, turn the sections into the adhesive so that the paper is facing outwards and you wet the paper, peel it away and there it all is. That's the idea anyway. Um, but the fact that we can work in, inside means that we can work throughout the year. It also means that it's a, a very sociable activity and that's a very important part of it. I mean, people enjoy making, um, but one of the things about making is that you've got something to be doing and to be thinking about. So you don't feel self-conscious about talking. A lot of people um, have been quite isolated and they find it difficult to be in a social situation and this kind of eases them in. And uh, yeah, it's become a very friendly group. Um, so then uh, Carol also got us this fantastic job, uh, which uh, is in Hoxton um, at the corner of Pitfield Street and Old Street. And it commemorates the, um, uh, the history, the local history of that area, uh, which was very much about um, entertainment. Uh, there were lots of music halls and things there. And I found um, an old music hall flyer poster that showed um, a performing dog act. And uh, so that was the inspiration for this. I'm not quite sure there were quite so many dogs um, in the act, but um, as you will see later, it's become a motto of the project that you can't have too many dogs. Um, but they, they did have acrobats as well. Um, so that's um, a, a detail of that one and of one of the dogs. And it's, you know, it, it was a nice design and I bumped up the colours as much as I could and made it as strong as I could. But it is a bit of a moral tale in the sighting of public art because the reality is that it looks like that. And it has to compete with oven baked every day, um, which it, it can't really do. I mean, it's possible many of you have walked past it and not even noticed it's there because it's, you know, mosaic isn't, doesn't have as much volume. It's not as loud as um, other things in the, in the contemporary city. So, yeah, it, maybe some kind of street art or something would have shouted louder and, and stood up better to that location. But still, it was a lovely, it was a lovely opportunity. And for those that do seek it out, you just have to concentrate and try and ignore the bread. Um, and then we got more, more jobs um, relating to wildlife. I mean, there are quite a lot of people who um, uh, are interested in urban wildlife, I think particularly in Hackney. And Hackney is blessed with the canal running through it. So this was a new development just by the canal. It was the Packety well, it still is called the Packington Estate, but they didn't want the word estate on it because they, they feel they've gone up in the world since it's um, been redeveloped. Um, and so that shows um, all the different fish in the canal who knew there were so many different ones, crayfish and all sorts of things, eels, um, and then the kind of birds 
uh, as well. And this one at Kingsland Basin um, is a similar uh, menagerie, I suppose. Um, both of these um, can be seen from quite a distance. And when I'm designing things for public spaces, I always try to make sure that... Oh, sorry about that. Um, uh, yes, uh, if they can be seen from a distance, I, I try and um, up the contrast so that um, uh, it'll read from a distance and then when you get close to it, you'll, you, there's more to find out. So that's one of the nice things about mosaic is that they're quite strong, so you can get an impact from a distance, but then you want to make sure that there is enough detail in it that it's worth, worth the detour of, of kind of going up um, and, and looking at them more closely. Um, that was very important for this one. This is back on Hackney Downs, um, and this one can be seen from way across the park. Um, so it needed to have a very strong sort of um, overall composition, um, but then reward you with lots of fascinating detail if you got up close to it. So again, you can see that it's got the names of the participants, it's even got a poem, this one. Um, and then it has the running dogs. Um, to begin with, um, this was just um, a, a project that we funded with crowdfunding. No, nobody commissioned it or anything, but my team was so keen, they just wanted to keep on making mosaics. So we did a bit of crowdfunding, got a bit of money, and um, uh, this was a problem wall for the park rangers. It kept getting covered in graffiti, and so, um, uh, it was a good idea to cover it up with, with, with something else. I have to say it's only had a tiny bit of graffiti since and it's been up for a few years now. Um, and I was inspired by the, the sight of running dogs across the, the downs. It's quite a big open park and um, full of dogs and they, they pick up a lot of speed as, as they go across the open space. And I've been watching them for the years that we've been working there. And so um, that was the original idea. Um, but as we started to make them people said oh that looks like my dog or couldn't i include my dog in that so the dogs became portraits of particular dogs um i should say i also included um wildflowers again with their names i'm determined to teach people the names of the wildflowers as you can see um there's a beautiful wildflower patch on hackney downs and uh, the park rangers are very proud of it and so I wanted um, to commemorate that. Um, also Hackney Parks are not very keen on having dogs in their buildings and we've always um, allowed dogs to come to the project so they're not keen on dogs and so I thought I would sort of sugar the pill by putting in the flowers that they were keen on. Anyway you can hardly see in this um, and the running dogs, but they do have their names above them. This is, a, this is another Roman reference, actually. Hunting dogs were so precious to the Romans that they often um, wrote their names in, in, in the mosaics. Um, but having started to do this, and there, as I say, there are so many dogs on Hackney Downs, um, we began to accumulate a list of dogs and, well, and their owners who would like to have their dogs commemorated as well. So we had to expand a bit and go around the corner and do a series of um, portraits of the local dogs. Um, and this turned out to be a really good idea for a, a public art, community art project, because it really did bring the community together. All kinds of people have dogs, new, new Hackney and old Hackney, um, the young hipsters and the, and the old people. Um, I mean, such a mix of people love their dogs and they would all congregate around our studio and show off their dogs and I would take, try and take photos, which is um, an art form in itself. I have a lot of photographs and wet noses as the dogs try and eat my phone. Um, but anyway, that, I got enough information to, to draw up the dogs. Um, and so that was, you know, a very, a very good bit of community building. Um, and I think people like, like the look of it as well. Of course, this was only the tip of the iceberg where we, um, there are another 33 dogs that we are nearly completed and will go on, on the next wall shortly, I hope. 
me just sum up. Um, and this, um, because I suppose we've, um, we've done a lot of animals, this was a, a dream job. Uh, this was a commission from London Zoo. And these um, panels are either side of the main entrance of the zoo. Um, chance of a lifetime, really. I actually, took, I have, must confess, I made this one myself because I need some mosaic therapy from time to time. Um, but yeah, slightly odd combination, but you can see they, um, uh, they work very well as a pair, but they're, they're quite far apart actually. Um, I wanted them to have some movement in, in them. Mosaic is brilliant at capturing movement because the, the lines of laying can kind of um, amplify the way the creatures are moving. Um, and they've got little bits of gold and silver in them as well um, to catch the light and twinkle, catch the eye. So um, yeah, we were very, very lucky to get a job like that. Um, Racing through. Um, so this is the one that we've um, done most recently. This is the um, the Acton Estate, which is a, an estate in Haggerston. In fact, we made this mosaic last year, and then there were a lot of problems about um, getting it fixed and getting the preparatory works done. It needed a, a screed laid and a nice uh, ring of um, granite sets around the edge. And extraordinarily enough, that work was done um, during the pandemic. Somehow like, everybody thought that was, the, that was the moment to do it. Having found it very difficult to do for nine months, they jumped to it. I think it's because it was outside and nobody else was involved and it was an ideal job for them. So that meant that we could um, get down and, and fix this mosaic. Um, again, this one is inspired by a Roman mosaic. This is a mosaic that I, I went to see in North Macedonia called, at a place called Heraclial Incestus, uh, which is one of the most beautiful mosaics I've ever seen. This is a pale imitation um, and, and is obviously quite a, a little bit different from that original. The original is a frieze um, and in the original there are very exotic trees and also some of the animals under the trees are actually killing each other because that's the kind of thing that the Romans often um, depicted, uh, you know, hunting scenes and bloody battles of one kind or another, not suitable for um, modern day Haggerston. So this is a more um, uh, bucolic scene. And the peg is, is that that is what Hackney used to be before it was um, uh, built up. And we did a little bit of research about the local history and found who Nathaniel Acton was and that's the kind of centerpiece of of the mosaic um, and then round it are the different the different animals and the different fruit trees um, the orchards um, and this is um, a job that we're hoping to work on shortly um, and is interesting, it's not um, exactly public art. This was a, a sample we did for the marketing suite. It's a big um, residential development in Hackney. And uh, they're going to incorporate um, mosaic kind of doormats at the entrance to the five blocks. Um, so mosaic is being kind of built into the character of the development. Um, and we're doing some of the signage as well, the floor numbers and things. Um, and I'm quite interested in that as an idea. Um, one of the things I like about wandering around the city, as I say, I like it to be entertaining. And I like the old residential developments where there are bits of stained glass or there are, um, you know, decorative front doors or sometimes garden paths. Um, and that just, you know, that it, it helps people um, identify with their own home. It makes each home slightly different, which is nice for the people who live there. It's also nice for the people who walk down the street. There's something, you know, a little bit of incident, a little bit of entertainment. And modern developments tend not to have that kind of character. They, you don't even know which part of the city you're in. You know, you might be in um, Battersea or Acton or anywhere. You know, the, the slab blocks go up and they're all pretty much of a muchness. 
And I very much like the idea that, that this sort of detail could be brought back into development, um, particularly if it involved community groups, because that keeps the cost right down and it, then it has a benefit for people who live in the community as well as for the people who, who walk through it. So anyway, that's, that's a dream of the future. And we've got this one jog, we'll see how that goes. Um, and this is another one that we've um, only just completed, which is another way of, of introducing mosaic into residential areas. So this is just somebody's front garden path. But again, it's in that sort of nice borderland between the private and the public realm and people just walking down the street can enjoy it and, and be entertained by um, creatures running in uh, enthusiastically into the house. So, um, yeah, I think, um, I think that's about it, really. What do I do now? Well, thank you so much, Tessa. Um, I think you can uh, stop uh, sharing your screen and then it will just become the two of us. Yeah, that seems to have worked. Have you done it? Have you done it? Uh, well, it's not, it's not sharing anymore, so that's, oh, good. that's all done. That's all done. So it's just us. And so, I mean, uh, I mean, I've got loads of questions. Oh, so dear. I might, I might uh, crack on, but if anyone, if anyone wants to put anything in the Q&A box, I'll see it. In fact, there was one question, which I might as well just ask straight away, uh, which was, um, Joe East was wondering, uh, she said that there's uh, a fake, that Hunkin is a famous name in public art. And she was wondering <laughs> if, uh, if there was any relation. Um, well, I don't know, she might be referring to my brother, Tim Honkin. Okay. Um, he doesn't really make public art. Well, he would be horrified to think of it as public art, but he makes automata and machines and things. Ah, okay. So there's a lot of creativity in the family. Well, you could say that, yeah. Or we're just completely bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> One or the other, yeah. Um, and... Uh, so uh, uh, what was I, I was going to ask so I'm a little bit ignorant about uh, Roman mosaics in the sense of I've been to see them but I'm just trying I'm trying to remember were they primarily used in a domestic setting because you said the Romans weren't interested in community art or you didn't you know you didn't know if they were or not but well, they certainly weren't interested in mosaic as therapy, you know, yeah. because the mosaics were mostly made by um, slaves, and I don't think they cared much about their welfare. Um, I, uh, it's a good question, actually. Um, I think most mosaics were domestic. They were in palaces. Um, villas is generally where, where one sees them. Um, Heraclea Lincestis, the one I mentioned, is definitely a villa. Um, there's a fantastic one in Sicily, Piazza Armarina. Um, and the ones that started me off were actually in North Africa, um, in Tunisia. Uh, it, it's sometimes quite hard to tell where the mosaics have come from. In Tunisia, they were all taken up in the 19th century and beautifully displayed in a museum in the Bardo. But um, they're kind of, you know, they're not in their original location anymore. So you, yeah. and they're mounted as if they're kind of pictures on the wall. Um, but I think by and large, yes, they, they, they were in, um, in villas and they were, yeah, so they were for the rich and powerful. Uh, and they were a symbol of, of wealth. Mm. And um, Kathy's, Kathy in the audience has actually asked, the, my next question as well so it's good that we're thinking on the same lines is there a is there any kind of map or trail to find all of these because I want to I want to go out and look for um, them. well yes there is um, on our website uh, Hackney Mosaic www.hackney-mosaic.co.uk uh, I hope there's a, that Rowena has put a link on, on the blurb, but anyway, uh, yes, I have done a map of where they all are. Um, they are mostly in and around Hackney. Um, uh, and I am thinking of, 
getting the map printed so that there'll be a paper version that people can actually take around with them. Yes, I think um, there's some, maybe it's a company called The Modernist Estate, I think, has started producing walking tours in different parts of London. And, and that's a printed map and it's a very yeah. nice object yeah. to have yeah. and to keep. Yeah, well, um, I did print out a few, but I only... I wasn't very ambitious and I just got photocopies. <laughs> I might I might bump it up a bit and get more, more copies. Yeah. And do you ever sell um this is now um, just, this has become a personal uh <laughs> intrigue. Uh but do you I mean do you ever sell prints of the mosaics because or raise use them to raise money for charity or anything? Um we we have postcards and green mm -hmm. postcards we sell those i didn't really explain this another thing that the project does is a um, minute the way i presented it because i was um i felt this was about public art i've concentrated on the public um uh, commissions that we've done but uh, the the volunteers also make their own their own artworks, which I have no control. I relinquish control entirely and they have total freedom. So yeah, it's the same to, to kind of offset the amount of bossiness I have to um, impose on them for the commissions. And we sell those works. So we were often at fairs locally in, right. in Acne and we have a little stall outside our workshop. Um, and we have, we sell stuff on Etsy. Um, so that's a way that we um, uh, we raise funds for the project. Um, we haven't done reproductions of the of the commissions, but yes, probably probably should. <laughs> no, I mean they I mean they are they are so totally beautiful and they feel kind of timeless because you're picking up on these sort of ancient artistic motifs, but they're also showing such sort of modern scenes. Well, yes, that was. That's kind of the idea. I do worry that they look um, kind of weird, you know, anachronistic. What are they doing in Hackney? But uh, it's kind of too late now. There are so many. No, I, th <laughs> they I, th I think I think it's I think they're easy for people to connect with. I mean, in in my opinion, um, it, it says in your bio that you trained as an architect. Did that did that have any impact on your attitude to the public sphere? And the way that people interact with it. Um, well, I suppose I suppose it did. Um, yeah, uh, up to a point. One of the things I couldn't stand about architects was their arrogance and the way that they felt that they could just sort of impose things on people. I come from that kind of era. I suppose I'm an old hippie at heart, and uh, I always felt that there should be more um, communication and more. Um, uh, more feedback about what was appropriate for public spaces and and what what people actually wanted rather than what um architects thought they wanted <laughs> slightly a negative thing i mean there were other things about the experience of architecture and the things that i learned that have been very very useful and um were you know um, the practical side of things and uh, understanding how building sites worked and, and all those kind of things have been have been very valuable um, but also, I, I mean, in, in a way, it was the experience of being an architect that propelled me into making because I found it very, um, I didn't like the process of telling people uh, what to make when I couldn't make it myself, you know, how, how to do processes that I, I was, I didn't you know, hadn't done myself. I used to try and do lots of DIY and things, but I was really a bit rubbish at it. And, and I knew that I was instructing people who were much better at things than I was. Um, and I, and I, that always felt a little bit wrong. So it was an opportunity, doing Mosaic was an opportunity to learn how to do one thing really well. And now I don't do so much making myself, but I feel I am in a position to show people and to design things um properly for for that particular medium because i know it properly yeah. i think i think in the uh, i think you'd probably agree that in the last few years the maker culture has really grown in yeah. popularity in london i mean do you ever do you does the mosaic project ever find itself interacting with or coming across other maker organizations or projects well, it, 
I don't think we did benefit particularly from the um, the recent kind of make, maker revival, which tended to be a little bit more tech, I think. Uh, and, yeah. and Mosaic is so um, sort of tech resistant. It's very difficult to mechanize. It's very difficult to um, bring the actual technique into the modern world. There wasn't a great spin off from that. But certainly when we started making mosaics back in the late 80s and early 90s, um, as a, as a as a small business and trying to be professional mosaicists, one of the problems we kept facing was that most people wanted to make them themselves. They didn't want to pay us to make things. They just wanted to be told how to do it. And so then we, you know, we started running courses and writing books and things. And that, you know, was another income stream. But um, yeah, uh, so yeah, no, that it is certainly a thing in modern life. I think partly because. Uh, the kind of the world of work doesn't involve making anything like as much as it used to. You know, there used to be lots of jobs um, that people who who liked working with materials and the skill of, of making and uh, getting things right. Um, you know, a lot of tailoring, seamstressing, embroidering, um, and for men, you know, furniture making, carpentry, all the all these things. You know, that those opportunities just aren't aren't there anymore and i and i think for some people i'm sure i'm like this that um making is is as i said um you know important for mental health it's recognized that physical exercise sport is you know essential for you know we don't need to go hunting anymore we don't need to run around and and chase things uh but we do it because it makes us feel whole it, it, it's a part of what we are and i think I, don't, I mean, I know it's not true for everybody, uh, certainly, but for some people, I think making, working with your hands, that uh, spending quiet time concentrating on materials, on physical stuff, um, and then seeing something at the end of it is a profoundly satisfying experience and, and nothing in the modern world has sort of replaced that really. Oh, well, cooking, I think cooking does. Cooking is similar, yeah. Yes, although, yes, although it feels like to some degree cooking has become a a, a one-upmanship or a sort of showing off <laughs> well, process. I think, yes, but I think, you know, you can do that with craft as well. <laughs> you can, I, I mean, there aren't enough mosaicists for it to become a competitive thing at the moment, but, you know, give it time. <laughs> I mean, have you, I, I, have you, have you noticed any particular interaction with the work via social media do you feel do, do you find people sharing things on different platforms or interacting or have you not looked at that at all um well we we have um an instagram account and that's for Hack, the hanging mosaic project and that's got yeah i mean that that's kind of grown and grown um that's that's certainly um quite popular um but again, you know, the trouble with social media is it's not a physical, it's all this, you know, it's virtual. Mm. Uh, in a way, it's going the wrong, the wrong way. You want to get people back down, getting their hands dirty. I, I, I guess one positive aspect is that, you know, when, I, when the London Society told me about this event, um, I, I instantly obviously looked up looked you up and I recognized uh, images that I'd seen uh, posted by Alice Rawson, on the design critic who'd you know previously been sort of um, la lavishing you with praise um, and I, so I do think it's in some ways if social media can draw you into into the real world to go and look at something because someone yeah. you respect yeah, yeah. that's yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Positive... No, I'm, I'm absolutely not against. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And do you and do you find um I mean do you find that the mosaics become almost adverts in of themselves? You know, how do people find the project? Do they see the mosaic and then say, I'd like to make one too or um well uh, recruiting volunteers, it uh, yes, it's 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 generally um lo local people who know about it. Um originally uh, again this is something I, I didn't really go into but um 
I work quite closely with the recovery services in Hackney and they referred people to the project. So this is people in recovery from addiction problems. Right. And they still, people from that, that service still remain the core of the group. Um, and I still get refer, you know, some referrals from them. Um, we do outreach projects as well. Um, funding is always, you know, total nightmare. Don't want to talk about that. But um, other organisations are, are better at getting funding than I am. And sometimes um, it, we, we go and, and, and make projects with them. So uh, we did one at St Anne's Hospital in Tot Tottenham, which is a psychiatric hospital. And we made something for um, uh, one of the, the wards there. And we did the sessions there. Um, and then we, from that experience, working with the patients, one of the people who we met there is now a member of the group. So, um, you know, we recruit people by going out to the community and then they get a taste for it. We did another one with a group of um, older people on an estate in Hackney and uh, we recruited um, somebody from there who now comes regularly. So. Um, it's one of the things I like about um, the group is that we're defined by the activity. We're defined by the fact that we make mosaics together, not by whatever problem people may have. So I like to get together people who come from all kinds of different groups and, you know, maybe they come from groups that are associated with a particular problem. But when they come to the project, that's not that's not their identity anymore they're mosaic makers we're all mosaic makers together um and i think that's um i think that's important and also i think it you know it enables people to share different perspectives on life um you know they do have problems but sometimes if you look at your problems in the context of other people's they don't seem quite so bad and you know there's a lot of sharing um they're very supportive to each other they're very yeah uh, that's something that's very touching to see. Yeah. And um, uh, you, you know, you, you talked a little bit about the process of making the murals with the doing them in reverse on paper. But um, Catriona in the in the Q and A has asked, you know, to a bit more about to know a bit more about the design process. So are they drawn by hand or um, are they developed on on a computer? How does it work? Um, well, I'm, I'm again, <laughs> it's a thing of my generation, I think. I grew up with drawing, with you mm -hmm. know, pencils and all that kind of thing. Uh, so that's how I start always. Um, and then, and then I scan it into the computer and I tweak away on, on a computer. And I find that, you know, very, very helpful. I'm sure a lot of, um, people watching this know that if you know if you're working with clients they change their mind or you know they ask for for something to be slightly different and um and if it's all on the computer you don't have to go back to the beginning again you can make little yeah. tweaks and adjustments uh, quite easily so um that's very useful um i find i find um hand drawing helpful i've never really quite been able to well i don't like drawing with a directly onto a tablet or anything it's too slippery i like the friction of, of a mm. pencil i i can't really do it without that um one of the nice things about designing for mosaic is that mosaic is quite a sort of textured uh surface the the final thing is quite sort of you know broken up and messy so you don't have to do um in a way the texture of crayons and pencils it gives you more of the feel of the final thing than if it's you know beautiful uh, flat washes that, that the computer will do for you. Although I do do that sometimes for backgrounds um, to try out different colours and things. But a little bit of kind of roughness gives gives it more character and maybe makes it a bit more like what the um, the final thing would be. Um, but then things like um, enlarging the images. Um, it's one of my favourite parts of the process, actually, I love it. But I do it in the old way. I just grid up the drawing, mm -hmm. and I grid up enormous pieces of brown paper, and then I have charcoal, and I, and I do it all by hand. And to begin with, I used to say, oh, God, there must be a better way. But I realise now that the more times you draw it, 
the better it is you know every time you draw it you make little adjustments and you make the, the lines get a little bit more convincing and also particularly drawing at full size you can tailor it very uh, finely to the size of the tesserae which if I'm making something it doesn't matter quite so much because that's I, I do that as I work but if I'm making it for people who aren't so confident and who haven't done it before if it all works out in in the module of the tiles and and it's clear you know where how how small they have to go for a particular bit and where they can get away with larger tiles um, that that that's helpful for them so and, and you can do that if you draw it all by hand at, at full size um, and I mean, um, I was thinking, you know, obviously, uh, hang on a second. Uh, oh, another question from uh, Joe. Uh, he asks, uh, does Tessa have a personal motif that she always includes? Includes, uh, as she says, as uh, he says, as per Grindley Gibbons' mouse. Not oh sure. yeah, Grindling, Grindling Gibbons. Yes. Uh, no. Well, I, I, I wish I did, but. Um, we don't even sign them. Uh, I, I've, so, I mean, usually, as you've seen, there are the big uh, plaques of lettering and things, and so something in there says it's made by us. And um, so, in those ones, they are. It is clear who authored them. I certainly don't don't have a symbol, and only and some things have, I don't even say who made them. I've recently um, the last two things we've we've made we've put the um initials of the project on them but unfortunately that's hmp which may be um confusing for some people because it looks like it's prison service yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh yes but no so um so yes apologies i i maybe i should think of a motif but it's probably a bit late now <laughs> and we're getting very technical with the questions now um, okay. Catherine would like to know what are the tesserae made of and where do you get them from? Um, well, it, for pavements, they're all um, unglazed ceramic because uh, that's a very good hard wearing material. Um, no mosaic materials are made in this country anymore, sadly. Um, but there are suppliers who, who hold them in this country. Various, you can find them online. Um, the unglazed ceramics are made in Portugal and in France. Um, for wall mosaics, we use um, sometimes we use ceramic as well, but mostly we use vitreous glass, which is the kind of glass that they use in used to use in swimming pools. I think you, it's really going out of fashion, um, and they are the walls of subways and cladding buildings. It's a sort of cheap form of mass produced small tiles of glass and they still are quite cheap a lot of those are made in china uh, and they're um yeah they're they're a good bargain at the project obviously i always have to do with what with my inability to raise funds and um, we have to keep the costs down as much as possible so uh, yeah we use the the cheaper um materials um there are uh, traditionally um byzantine mosaics are made of another kind of glass, which is called small tea, which is also available, almost entirely made in Italy. Uh, some is made in Mexico, and actually the Russians make small tea as well. Um, but it's handmade, very beautiful, exactly the same, made in exactly the same way that it was made in Byzantine times. And so if I was, you know, we're all thinking about staycations. Yeah. At the moment. If I was going to go and see a Roman mosaic in the UK would is there one that you'd recommend um well Rome um I think Ro British Roman mosaics are a little bit boring they're right uh, one, one of the problems is that is geology it all depends very much on geology and Britain doesn't have very interesting colored stones so they tend to be black white and a bit of terracotta so in terms of color they're not very interesting St Albans has some nice ones St Albans would be a good place to go okay uh, and there are very and um it's such a shame we can't go to the British Museum anymore but, uh, where they have fantastic um, examples uh, from all over what was the Roman Empire. Uh, 
I think they've announced their um, opening dates. Have they? Yes. Oh, I don't I don't have them to hand. No. But no. I saw I saw a headline. So oh. oh well that's good. Yes. Yes. Well that's I, I recommend uh, when that reopens the trip to the British Museum. Okay. okay. My my last last question is uh, obviously we are the London Society and London is a Roman city. And so do you do you do you think do you think that people still connect to mosaics in that way that they, because you're, you know, you're taught about the Romans in school, you go to the Museum of London, you go to the British Museum, it's all, you know, it's kind of Roman, Roman, Roman. So do you think, do you think it has a sort of intrinsic link to where we live? Well, I don't know. I mean, I have been told that, uh, well, and in fact, I know this is true, you can still collect uh, Roman tesserae uh, from the Thames. Yeah. Uh, and I did hear a story, which I don't know whether is true, is that there was a guy who collected enough tesserae to um, do his kitchen floor, uh, <laughs> but that he kept it quiet because it was a council flat, and he, and he thought he'd be evicted if they ever knew that he'd made himself a Roman floor. Um, so uh, it obviously influenced him, <laughs> the thought of being in a Roman city, I don't know. I don't know if these. Uh, I, I suppose it just depends on on people whether they um, whether they respond to the romance of that. I know I spent some of lockdown walking the Roman wall around the city, and that was um, very exciting. But I should also say that mosaic isn't just to do with um, antiquity. Um, there is a, a history of mosaic. There was a mosaic revival in the nineteenth century, and there's a lot of um, 19th and 20th century mosaic in London. Mm. It's very worth um, looking out for. Um, St Paul's St Paul's Cathedral has a lot. The National Gallery floor is um, a wonder to behold. Tate, Tate Gallery has some wonderful floors. Um, yeah, so it's not it's not just the Romans. A long history of mosaics connected to yeah connected to the city. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was gonna, I, I was gonna wrap up there, but I just feel like I've got to ask Kathy's quick question, where she says, "Where in, where in St Albans can you see mosaics apart from uh, the uh, Verulamium Park?" Uh, yes, in the museum. I think it's the Verulamium Museum. I'm sorry, I haven't been for a little while, but uh, I think I think most of them, as I was saying about Tunisia and the Bardo, they're not. They're not in situ anymore. They've been lifted and taken to the, the museum. Excellent. Um, well, that was amazing. And um, I think when I walk around town, I'm going to pay closer attention <laughs> to the mosaics I see, and I'm definitely going... I guess the Apple Store, the Apple Store on, on Oxford Circus has got mosaics on the outside because it was the head office of Salviati and Company who were the 19th century mosaicists in London. That's one to look for. This is, it feels like there's a guidebook. In the <laughs> <main thing. laughs> yes. But uh, no, I think everyone would join me in um, thanking you, Tessa. It was fascinating. Um, yes, and I should be going down to Hackney Downs ASAP. Yes, good, please. Um, the, the project is suspended temporarily, but I think we'll be back up and running soon. And we always love visitors. So um, if, if anybody wants to come by, come in, and it's a day when the processions are running. Come and say hello. Great. Will do. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.